Good morning, church. Welcome. Welcome to our live stream this morning. People from Pilgrim, people from Emmanuel, welcome. We are glad that you can join us. We are glad to gather remotely, even if it's in these conditions and in this COVID, Zoom, YouTube, pandemic, Sundays. It's all weird, but 
let's get weirder and let's celebrate this morning together that Christ is with us and let us walk into the kingdom together through word, through song, through prayer. I'd encourage you to write something in the chat. Let us know that you are there. We want to connect with you. So say hello, say good morning, say praise the Lord. Whatever you want to write, this is your space and this is our time to gather and worship. Um, this is a special Sunday, one, because it is Communion Sunday, and second, because we have our people from IBC joining us. Um, JV is joining us on the piano, so yay. Um, we're doing a joint uh, worship team this morning, and this is exciting, and I think the Lord is going to do something great. So let us open our hearts, let us open some, our minds, and let us just be open to the work of the Holy Spirit as we come to His presence. Uh, we will turn now to our calls to worship. It will uh, show up on the screen, so please join me uh, in the all parts. We have come to worship God. The Lord our God is one. Unite us in heart and mind for the sake of our world. May your spirit bind us together in peace. May our praise be lifted that our hearts would receive courage. May we be renewed in service to our world. Amen. Amen. So this first song uh, is new for everyone, for pilgrim people, for IBC people. This is a song based on the preface of the Eucharist liturgy or communion liturgy, where you say, lift your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. And we're going to show you the chorus real quick. It, it has a call and response chorus. So I will call and you all can respond with Ari here. It goes a little bit like this. Lift your heart. We lift them up. Lift your voice. Lift your heart, we lift them up. Lift your voice, we lift our souls. Let's try that again. Lift your heart, we lift them up. Lift your of the Lord. The peace of the Lord is upon us. Joy will be our strength. The Lord be with you this morning. We come to give thanks. Lift your heart. Lift your Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Sing together, praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord who were all things so wondrously reigned. Shelters thee under his wings, yes, yeah, so gently sustained. Hast thou not seen how thy desires are have been granted in what he ordained? Prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do. Live with his love, he be Gladly. 
come to you this morning acknowledging our need we need you Lord and we just pray that you would come and meet us where we are in our living rooms in this empty church we long for your presence Lord Let it be the cry of our hearts to say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come break in, break into our silence, into our walls. Come into our empty space and fill it, Lord, with your presence, with your love, with your kindness. Bring us together as one. We sing all who are thirsty.
Sing as deep cries out. As deep cries out to thee. As deep cries out to thee. As deep cries out to thee. Steep cries out to deep. We sing. you this morning in response to what we've just sang. Maybe extend your arms like this. Paul says, I want men everywhere to lift holy hands in prayer to the Lord. And sometimes there's something about aligning our bodies with our words and our thoughts that help bring about change within us because we are body and spirit woven together. And as we've prayed and sang, I just want to invite you right now this morning to say, Holy Spirit, come and fill me anew. Paul instructing the churches said this, that we ought to keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit, that there's something about our willfulness that we need to surrender in order to cooperate with God's work in our life on an ongoing basis. And so, Holy Spirit, fill us again. Renew your wonders in us. Expand our imagination for what we can be in you and through you and for you, for the sake of the world. Holy Spirit, fill your people with your presence, your power, your awe, your wonder, that we might know Jesus is alive and at work among us and in this world. So I just invite you just to wait for a moment in that open-handedness. And maybe you're like me and you've had a week of all kinds of things and you need to, you've come in like this. You barely clicked on that link this morning. You barely were able to, to force yourself and right now you're waffling between that and five other things. And I just invite you to take your hands and go from the fist to the openness and say, Holy Spirit, renew within me all the things of God's grace in my life. Or to borrow from David, renew in me the joy of my salvation. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O God. Lord, we receive from you today. Help us to reorder our lives and our weeks and awaken those that are drifting away Encourage those that are moving towards you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I'm going to invite our um, brother Paul from Emmanuel to come. Or no, we're going to listen to scripture and then Paul's going to come. Sorry. Uh, So hear the words of the Lord this morning. Today's narrative lectionary is from Luke 7, 1 to 10. After Jesus finished presenting all his words among the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion had a servant who was very important to him, but the servant was ill and about to die. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to Jesus to ask him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they earnestly pleaded with Jesus. He deserves to have you do this for him, they said. 
He loves our people, and he built our synagogue for us. Jesus went with them. He had almost reached the house when the centurion sent friends to say to Jesus, Lord, don't be bothered. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. In fact, I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. I'm also a man appointed under authority. My soldiers... Uh, the word and my servant, sorry, um, authority, with soldiers under me. I said to one, go, and he goes, and to another one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and the servant does it. When Jesus heard these words, he was impressed with the centurion. He turned to the crowd following him and said, I tell you, even in Israel, I haven't found faith like this. When the centurion's friends returned to his house, they found the servant restored to health. This is the gospel of the Lord. Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Paul, and I'm from IBC. Let us affirm our faith together. Jesus taught us to speak of hope as the coming of God's kingdom. We believe that goodness and justice and love will triumph in the end, and that tyranny and oppression cannot last forever. One day, all tears will be wiped away, the Lamb will lie down with the Lion, and justice will roll down like a mighty stream. True peace and true reconciliation are not only desired, they are assured and guaranteed in Christ. This is our faith. This is our hope. Amen. Amen. I invite you now to agree with me as I lead in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you that not only are you our loving Father, but also the sovereign ruler of the nations. And Lord, as we survey our tur turbulent world, still caught in the throes of this COVID-19 pandemic, we cry out to you for your mercy, that you bring a soon end to it according to your will. This morning, our hearts turn to Myanmar and the recent military coup there. We ask that you, we ask that violence and oppression be restrained and that further injustices be curtailed. We pray for those politicians who have been taken prisoner. Oh Lord, may you release them soon. God of mercy, Lord of love, we also pray for the many countries who are currently undergoing conflict and humanitarian crises. We think of Yemen, Syria, Ethiopia, and many other places, Lord, where there's so much suffering and evil and brokenness. And as we behold the turmoil in this broken world, our hearts ache, and we long for the Prince of Peace to return and establish your kingdom. We pray for the vaccine shorter situation here in Canada and ask that your hand be upon our political leaders and public health officials to guide them. We pray likewise for our provincial leaders and our situation here as we continue to live under the current restrictions. Father, we miss being able to gather together as your people and we ask for your healing hand to bring hope and blessing in the meantime. We pray for our brothers and sisters of Emmanuel and Pilgrim Church, especially our seniors, for those who are especially isolated if they don't own a computer. May social distancing not lead to distancing between us as family in love and care for each other. And may we find every way we can to stay connected during this time. It is a difficult time. And Lord, I know there are some who are discouraged and weary and have drifted away, not only from your people, but have even grown cold towards you. So as we gather together to worship you this morning, I pray you'll fan the flames of devotion in us by your Holy Spirit. We pray all this in the worthy name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you now to 
confess together responsively. Please read the bold sections marked all on the screen. We fool ourselves if we think that our ways are hidden from God. Therefore, let us confess our sin, trusting in the mercy of God, our maker. God, you are everlasting, the creator of all that is. Your understanding is beyond measure. We confess to you that we have sinned against you and our neighbors. In your compassion, forgive us, for we place our hope in your steadfast love. Praise the Lord. Our God heals the brokenhearted and binds up our wounds. Amen. Thank you, Paul, for leading us in that time of prayer, prayer of confession. Here at our church, we mix both modern uh, pieces of worship and words along with some ancient ones and practices as well. Uh, confession of, of our sins, affirmation of faith are two of those along with what we're going to end with today, communion. Um, and before I talk about offering, I just want to remind you to have some bread and juice ready for the end of the service because we're going to take communion together separately. <clears throat> it's not ideal, but it is what it is for COVID times. Uh, I will use this in just a second, so I'm going to put this over here on the music stand. Uh, so... For those of you that cannot hear live mics in the room, everyone is laughing at me for draping that over uh, the music stand. So um, anyway, we're going to take our offering at this time. And uh, I just want to thank you for your giving to the churches and supporting them. You can see on the screen that there are uh, two uh, links to all the giving ways you can give to support the church. And I do want to thank you during this time. Um, you know, things in the church world have been all over the map, and we've been excited here at Pilgrim to see God's faithfulness through you in your engagement with home churches, your engagement with giving, your engagement with relationships and calling, uh, and, and when we can gather in various ways as the provincial orders go up and down and all over the map. Um, thank you for making this community happen during this time, because that's really what the church is. It's Jesus and people, Jesus and people. And at the end of the day, <clears throat> that's all we have. So thank you for giving and supporting the church. <clears throat> you can do that two ways. Uh, actually, actually uh, let me rephrase that. You can do that three ways. Um, and you can give to your individual congregation if you're joining from Emmanuel or Pilgrim today. Um, you can see emmanuelbc.ca forward slash give or pilgrimchurch.ca forward slash give. Uh, you can give old school to either church by just mailing in a check to the church's physical address uh, via Canada Post. You can give online uh, also through PayPal or through e-transfer. And so with PayPal, uh, you don't have to have a PayPal account, but you can give with credit card, debit card, checking account if you have a PayPal account, or e-transfer. And for Pilgrim, it's just giving at pilgrimchurch.ca. And if you go to Emmanuel's uh, website there, you can find their e-transfer uh, addresses as well. They're giving online giving options as well. So I want to encourage you to do that, to support the local work of the church. We're transformed by giving. Um, I live in that testimony of my life again and again and again. I found that that investment that I make in the local church uh, pays back in relationship, pays back in helping see the church move beyond me and my generation and my needs. And when we give, it sets us free from the control of money. Indeed, it's not a gift if we hang on to it when we release it. Uh, and so we want to release that into God's hands and empower the work of the local church. So thank you for giving. Let's pray for the gift and giver. Lord, we thank you that you meet all of our needs and that giving is more about us being transformed in our relationship with money and with others this side of the world to come. And so, Lord, I do thank you that you own it all, all the cattle, all the gold, all of it is ultimately yours, and we are stewards of it for this season. May we learn that lesson of stewardship through the practice of giving out of their generosity, out of sacrifice, and let that giving transform us as we release that gift. And God, forgive us if we try to be manipulative with giving. For ultimately, we're just hurting ourselves. So we release that to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. I think uh, I need to use this now. I was going to use it later. But I think this will be a great way to start the message this morning. Again, thank you for joining us online now or later. And uh, let's see, I normally don't get my clothing on in front of the camera on live uh, stream, but I think this is important uh, little illustration. So this is a, uh, a robe here, and uh, 
don't know if I'm going to zip it all up. I think I'll just leave it like that. I won't zip it. Uh, I do have, I'm fully clothed underneath, for those of you wondering, okay. In these live stream days, we often wonder if we're in meetings and we see people's top half, are they wearing pants? Trust you, everyone at Pilgrim, when we are live streaming, is fully clothed all the time. That's kind of funny. Okay, all right. This morning, we're going to dig into the rest of our series on the local church and particularly around the issues of having peace with God. And we've been exploring five T's of barriers that Jesus overcomes and in his overthrowing of religious approaches to God. That in fact, the fundamental issue of Christ is God coming one of us, entering in creation, and ending our religious approaches to coming to God, removing all of those barriers. And yet the church over time sets up barriers, barriers that keep people from experiencing direct connection with God, sometimes rooted in things that were life-giving and helped in the past and no longer serve that purpose. So today, we're going to look at this idea of Tradition and tribe, the two big topics today are tradition and tribe. There is an outline online that you can follow along with, take notes with, and home church questions so you can go deeper with this message in home church and on your own this week. Let me give you the little blurb to sort of summarize what we want to tackle today. Fear and self-preservation become powerful instincts with tradition and tribe. Yet Jesus tells us that these instincts about fear and self-preservation, they are important, but they also need to be checked by love. And this is one of these tensions we live into as followers of Jesus, that on one hand, our our woke postmodern spiritual gurus out there say, you need to be fully attentive to all of your emotions, but those that are more nuanced will also step back and say, we also need to be attentive to them, but, but ask questions of them as well. And Jesus has been saying this from the very beginning. We need to filter them or check them through love. So what traditions, what tribalisms, what balkanizations do we hold to that keep us from being the people that God wants us to be? And so we want to explore again more of these five T's today. And I'll give you a quote from a, he was a Lutheran and he converted to orthodoxy, a theologian, historian, Yaroslav Pelikan, and he says this, Christianity calcifies Hear this this morning. Open your ears. Christianity calcifies the living faith of the dead. It becomes tradition, becomes traditionalism. So when Christianity calcifies, when tradition, the living faith of the dead, becomes traditionalism, the dead faith of the living. And so today we want to explore Jesus' teachings and clarify about what it means to be his follower, particularly around these issues of tradition and tribalism. This morning I put on a, a robe Uh, This is an academic robe, but there's preaching robes in some church traditions, and normally you would have a stole or like it's basically a long scarf that has the colors of the church year, which is a whole other tradition that I actually kind of like. We don't do that much in Baptist land, but we have in other churches. And in some traditions, you would have to preach in this robe, and this robe was a symbol of like the the mantle of Christ on the preacher and, and blocked out their clothing underneath, their social economic class, and has some powerful symbolic meaning when one put on a preaching robe and the stole with the colors of the season of the church year, that it was a visual representation. Now, in the church that I became a Christian in, We did not wear these kinds of things. The choir might have wore a robe, choral robes, to uh, sing in, but the pastor certainly did not. But in our tradition, we required that people would dress up. You had to wear a suit and tie. Uh, Here in Canada, we would say something, I guess, like the queen. If you were to visit the queen, what would you wear to visit the queen? And this idea of certain clothing to present a certain formula or a certain image to others and to God when we gathered was part of our tradition. Now, in my tradition, wearing this as a pastor, we would call that dead traditionalism. Look at those guys. Look at those dead, whoever, Lutherans, Catholics, uh, United Methodists, wearing all of their garb, parading around like they thought they were somebody better than everybody else. But then on the other side of the same coin, We would wear suits and ties if you were a man or a dress if you were a woman to church. And we would say, well, if you were going to meet with the president or you were going to meet with the queen, what would you wear? This, of course, is human tradition. Capital, no, rather lowercase t, human tradition. This idea of clothing in church. I like how Bruxy talks about this idea of what would Jesus wear to church. Again, in the Pentecostal tradition, in the faith church tradition, we would dress up. Wear your best for God. 
God doesn't care, by the way. He saw you in your birthday suit. He sees you when you're on the toilet. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So, well, anyway, oh, that's, yeah, that is God, not Santa Claus, by the way. In fact, if you study the New Testament about clothing, what the New Testament says about clothing, the only passages that talk about clothing tell us that what's on the inside counts, not the outside. It says things like, be clothed with Christ, put on Christ. And in fact, when you get into actual fabrics and details, you hear the opposite message of the tradition I was raised in. If you read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, when Paul is addressing sort of the women's clothing styles of the ancient world, the only thing we see there is dress down instead of up when you gather in church. In James 2, the same thing in 1 Peter 3, verse 3. In the tradition that I was raised, dressing up was our version of what Jesus might call the tradition of the elders. I'm going to take this robe off now because it is warm, and so here it goes. Maybe I better throw it on the floor here. I'm going to throw it over the monitor. There we go. All right, nobody can see it. It's gone. So this idea of tradition and traditionalism is the first big subject we want to address today. So let's pray, and we're going to read a passage and dig in. Lord, thank you that you care about us and that you have come to tear down the walls, the walls that we put up that keep people from experiencing God both in the community of the church and personally through your Holy Spirit as well directly with them. So Lord, I pray today that you would continue to move in our midst and draw us into a deeper understanding and experience of you through your word as we tackle the issue of the traditions of men or the elders and our tribalisms or our balkanizations. I pray that you would anoint what is of you today and that they forget the rest. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So Jesus tells us in John 4, which has been one of our key texts here, um, that there were five T's, five things that Jesus tackles when he has this conversation with a Samaritan woman. Remember, Samaria is the land between Judea and Galilee that pious Jews would often uh, try to avoid or go around, but Jesus goes right through it and has this encounter with the Samaritan woman with on all kinds of history in her life. And we talked about these five T's, and we're slowly going through them, of walls of religiosity that Jesus comes to confront within his Jewish context, and him, of course, being fully Jewish and fully God, as we believe is revealed in his life, his death and resurrection later. But these five T's are Torah, tribalism, uh, Torah tradition, tribalism, territory, and temple. And now we've already addressed the Torah one a little bit, and we have an online sermon that I encourage you to go back and watch later that was uh, delivered at Emmanuel last week, but it's online at the Pilgrim website, around the law in the Old Testament. And today we want to move this forward into tradition and tribalism. Uh, I don't know, but when I hear the word tradition, if you have been raised seeing the musical uh, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, immediately often when I heard the word tradition within a Jewish context, is sort of the Hollywood schmaltzy version of Tevia singing, tradition, tradition, okay? Uh, and so whenever I hear that word, that kind of plays in the back of my mind. I don't know about you if I just ruin this sermon for you, but there we go. Tradition, dealing with tradition. Jesus tells the woman at the well that what was is now coming into fulfillment, and now there is a new reality because of who he is. He makes a claim on all people forward and backward in time that is amazing and astounding that we wrestle with to this day. And so again, Yaroslav Pelikan says this, Christianity calcifies when tradition, the living faith of the dead, becomes traditionalism, the dead faith of the living. And that dead faith can be expressed in all kinds of ways. Within Judaism of the day, there was, of course, the law, what we call the first books in our Old Testament, the five books of Moses, the Torah, the law that was given, but there was also additional rules that they developed to slap on top of Torah. In fact, this is a wonderful phrase. If you get nothing else today, get this one. They believed that if we could be more conservative than God, somehow it would ultimately result in even a better humanity and flourishing for all. And so they had the oral Torah that went on top of the, uh, the law in the Old Testament. And the idea was to put a fence around the law. This idea that if this is what God's command was in Old Testament, then let's make rules and obligations that keep us even farther away from that as well. So Sabbath keeping 
everything became about only walking so many paces or only staying within this zone or boundary. Uh, and all kinds of things got added to this, this oral Torah. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, he begins to confront both the Torah as is and say, you're misapplying it and the oral Torah or the guardrails around the law or the fence around the law or to put it in a conservative Christian context, when we are acting more conservative than God, this is something that Jesus confronts and says, ultimately, you're missing the boat by a mile and drowning in the sea. And so these extra rules that were added, these traditions of the elders as they were called. I remember uh, sometimes I grew up in South Dakota in the States and you would drive out into the countryside and in some cases you would see this double fencing in certain uh, types of animals to help control their, if they broke through the one fence or also for herding groups into subgroups as well. Sort of this double fencing image comes to mind as well. Pastors like to preach about guardrails as well in our faith. We need to have guardrails that help us when we come around sharp curves. And guardrails to an extent are, are an okay concept except when the guardrail sort of comes across the road and you can't get through and you're no longer driving on the road again. So this idea of being more conservative than God, putting a fence around the law, the tradition of the elders, Jesus confronts. And so he comes, and, and some of the verses, we look at this, and let's look at one of these core texts here this morning again. Um, Luke chapter 10 is, uh, let's go there, turn there for a second. I'm old school, I like the paper Bible. So if you're new to reading scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the first four books of the, Old, of the New Testament, rather, in the Christian Bible. So here we go. Let's read this passage this morning as we look a little bit deeper into this. And he tells a story. The expert asks this question of this. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Big picture stuff here. How do I enter the kingdom of heaven in the life to come? And he said to him, what is written in the law? So Jesus responds with a question. How do you understand it? A second question from Jesus. God knows when we're asking questions, by the way, to avoid direct encounter and rather to, or to engage with him. And so Jesus asked questions back to him very wisely, sort of this Aristotelian method here. The rabbis did it as well. The expert answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Read this a little more here. Set our stage. But the expert wanting to justify himself, the expert not wanting to hear what Jesus said, the person drenched in tradition and scripture and the rules around Torah wanted to justify himself to know that, hey, I'm okay as I am. It's all of you folks over there that need to work on your stuff. I'm okay the expert wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? If you ask God, the creator of all, of course, they wouldn't have recognized him that way at that point, who is your neighbor? You are setting yourself up for some education. And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him and beat him and went off, leaving him half dead. Naked guy, dead, side of the road in the ditch. Now by chance, verse 31, a priest was going down that road, but when he saw the injured man, he passed on the other side. He passed over to the other side, not to deliver, but to avoid deliverance. Hear this language. So to a Levite, a religious leader, sort of like the priest would be a higher level, the Levites, the priests were chosen from the Levites, so now we got the next rung in the religious uh, sacredness ladder of people in ancient Judaism. So to a Levite, when he came up to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But when a Samaritan who was traveling came to where the injured man was, he saw him, he felt compassion to him, he went up to him, he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, he put him on his own animal, on his own animal, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins, and if you're paying attention to penny stocks, they were worth more even than that back in the old days, took out two silver coins, gave it to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him, and whatever else you spend, I will repay you when I come back this way. And Jesus responds, after telling this parable, which of these three do you think became a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? 
The expert in religious law said this to Jesus, the one who showed mercy to him. And so Jesus said to him, go and do the same. In this parable, Jesus is attacking all kinds of tradition and tribalism as well as we're going to talk about in the second little piece here. In Mark 7, verses 1 through 9, another passage that talks about these issues of tradition and tribalism, I want to read that one to you, just a few quick verses here. Mark 7, 1 through 9, and I encourage you to turn there or flip there. Jesus tells this, is engaging again with the religious leaders. He says, Now the Pharisees and some of them were experts in the law, came from Jerusalem and gathered round him. And when they saw that some of Jesus' disciples ate their bread with unclean hands, that is, unwashed, not ritually or clean, for the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they performed the ritual washing, mikvah, and holding fast to the traditions of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash their hands. They hold fast to many other traditions, the washing of cups, pots, kettles, etc. Verse 5, the Pharisees and the experts in the law asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders? but eat with unwashed hands. And he said to them, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you hypocrites. That's a way to start a good sermon. Hey, you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. And then he says this, verse 8 and 9, having no regard for the command of God, you hold fast to human tradition And he also said to them, you nearly reject the commandment of God in order to set up your tradition. You nearly reject the core teaching of God in order to set up your tradition. Tom Rainer talks about this in a wonderful book on autopsy of a deceased church, by the way, and I highly recommend it. And when we care more about how we did things in the past, well, that one needed to go. When we care more about things in the past than how God is moving now and how we're applying the word now in real time, We set up our own traditions against the big point. This is when churches enter into death spirals, when they make choices again and again around leadership, around styles of liturgy and preaching and music and all of those things, around what was vibrant for a generation past, the traditions of men versus what is the spirit doing now and how can we help move the mission forward? And so Jesus came in his time and he dealt with this tradition, the traditions of the elders, the traditions that were putting walls up between people, understanding who God was, and and between these things that made the religious folk feel good about themselves. Like the oral Torah, it was believed to have its root in Moses' additional teachings, but Jesus condemns it because it led to human traditions and opinions to be made ultimate in the lives of the faithful. Today, again, those who claim loudly to follow the Bible are often inserting their own way instead of God's way. They put a veil or screen of their pre-understanding, just like the church that I was raised in, and they moved away from this eventually, praise the Lord. If you weren't dressed up, occasionally someone would actually come up to someone and say, hey, we have an extra jacket that you could put on, or the elders or the ushers couldn't ush unless they were in uniform. That is a tradition of men. It has nothing to do with the core teachings of Jesus. We put a veil or screen. Sometimes it's cultural. Sometimes it's other church traditions. But Jesus says to them, as he says to us today, be careful about your little T traditions. They might keep you from the very thing that you say you're protecting by them. To be more conservative than God, just like to be, quote unquote, I don't know, you be more liberal than God in terms of his mercy and grace, is to miss the road, is to focus on the guardrail, is to focus on a fence, is to focus on something that might have been life-giving in the past but is no longer. Oral Torah, again, Jesus confronts this. What are our oral traditions? What are our little T traditions that stand in the way? I've seen it with music in the church. I've seen it with dress codes. I've seen it with certain theology. Some of my dear, dear, dear reform friends will start with a certain view of sovereignty that is more platonic than an, and certain version of August, Augustinianism versus actual scripture. And they read everything through the Bible through this lens. And then it conveniently ignoring every piece of scripture that doesn't align with that view. We need to wrestle with these things. The church in the Reformation began to recapture this idea that those little t traditions can become uh, things that keep us from the living commands of God, as Jesus says here in Mark uh, chapter 7, verse 9. They had this motto, and Augustine, ironically, also talked about this, that the church is always reforming. Ecclesia semper reformander us, that the church is always reforming. And the reformers added to it and said, basically, the reformed church should always be reforming, but then it calcified after the initial reformation 
I talk about being someone influenced by Baptists and Anabaptists and Charismatics. The Anabaptists were the rebaptizers. They rejected the idea of infant baptism as part of your nationality and citizenship. They rejected the idea that a state church was a legitimate church because if it's baptizing people in the name of Jesus and the state, it's not really doing authentic baptism. And they felt that the reformers like Lutheran and Calvin didn't, Luther and Calvin did not go far enough. I like how Bruxy says this, unlike the Catholic and Orthodox churches, the Protestants protest protestants put the bible not church tradition at the center of their faith but the radical reformers said that's a fine first step but now let's keep jesus at the center of the bible that you've put at the center of our faith this has implications the traditions that we need to be aware of in our day as well separation of church and state they also rejecting coercive power in the name of belief, that we don't force belief that God is wooing and drawing, but as a people side of the church, the Jesus and the people side, we don't coerce people to believe. As much as sometimes I wish I could coerce you to believe, and I was raised in a church where we told stories all the time, and that's why I don't tell a lot of stories in my sermons, because sometimes I think stories are used to manipulate people. Stories can be important. Again, we know when we listen to a story, it helps us suspend our disbelief function our critical function we sort of put on hold and that bothers me deeply because I was manipulated again and again and again by stories well what would you wear if you were meeting with the queen see that story that has story that narrative in order to uh, back up a tradition of man that has really nothing to do with what the Bible says about clothing and God and worship it's meant to pull on your heart it's meant to circumvent your critical faculty Ooh, I'm meeting with the queen there is only one king and ruler over all. And it's not Sauron, the Lord of darkness. It's Jesus, the Lord of light. <laughs> the radical reformers said this, faith is a free choice rather than an inherited expectation or a family or nation. Another way of saying that is God has no grandchildren. Each of us must own our faith personally and then corporately as well. Baptism is a sign of personal faith versus parents' faith. Believer's baptism versus infant baptism. I think there's something to be said for infant baptism, and I like groups like the Evangelical Covenant Church that say, okay, it's, it's a pick your adventure on baptism. And there's certainly some arguments for that being parents taking a proactive step of faith in the communal context, but ultimately you have to own your own relationship. And the radical reformers said, particularly in response to infant state church baptism, where it was your citizenship and your Christianity, they felt, no, no, you as it must own it as a believer, believer's baptism. And then finally, this adherence to nonviolence and enemy love, because Jesus modeled that for us. Talking more about this tradition today, and we'll get a, run out of time here for tribalism, but we'll get there. Peace does not mean being passive, but is engaged. It's assertive. It's provocative sometimes. It's questioning while still holding Jesus at the center and the ruler and the lens for us all. I want to talk more about this idea of tradition and how Jesus undoes it, and how if we're going to follow God and have peace with God, we have to get beyond the traditions of men and women. In Matthew 9, Jesus tells this story, uh, again, a parable. Now, Jesus used storytelling, interestingly, in very provocative ways, not simply to reaffirm the traditions as they are, but to expose them and undo them. And I like how when Jesus told one story, uh, and he's talking to the disciples, and the disciples come to him afterwards after he uses a parable, and he says, we didn't get your story. <laughs> I love that. And then he explain, explains it to them like line by line. Uh, this is what the story meant. Um, but in this one story, he talks about the idea of the wineskin. And it's not even, it's, a, it's an example from real life. I should say it's an illustration more than even a story. He says, once a wineskin, uh, you would put wine, new wine, into a new wineskin, into a new sort of knit together skin of intestine, and it would expand with it. And he said, no one puts that wine into an old wineskin because it will bust it. And he says this, this idea of wineskin, and, and I'm going to quote Bruxy here, once the wineskin of a particular structure or tradition or organization becomes our focus, protecting the wineskin instead of the wine, the benefit of the wine will be missed. And no one ever quenched their thirst by chewing on a wineskin. Right now in your life, particularly if you're a Christian, there may be traditions that are not helpful in advancing the mission of God. 
Ancient Israel had got off task here. The prophets had said that the purpose of Israel was to be a nation, to be a missional nation to the rest of the nations of the world, but it turned inward again and again and again. Isaiah prophesies this. We see in Genesis that God's intention, when again the Abrahamic covenant is developed, Adam and Eve represent all of humanity, and then God works through Abraham in this line again to expand his blessing and make it personal for everyone. But they missed it again and again and wanted to protect the wineskin instead of this wine, the treasure within. Our temptation again and again is to lick the outside of the cup instead of what is the inside of the cup or the purpose of the cup, which is to deliver the water that gives us life. So to end the tradition piece, we need to ask, why are we doing what we're doing? Does it form us in the way of Jesus? Or does it contradict the clear teachings of the Bible and of Jesus? The ditches of legalism or traditionalism or being more conservative from God or libertinism, forgetting that what we do has implications, are ditches we need to stay out of to stay walking on the road of the path of love as described by Jesus. I went a little longer on that one than I thought, but let me give you one more story, a real story that happened to me. Some years ago, I was in a church that was wrestling with renewal and revitalization. And I had a group of people come into the church who felt like the church had to use a certain music style. And I'm going to put my cards on the table right here. I'm going to irritate some of you this morning because I love you and you need to hear this. I had someone come up to me and say, we must teach these young people to sing hymns. And I said to him, well, yeah, I'm fine with hymns. I was trained classically as a musician. I went to uh, university originally on music scholarship and choral music and and made it into honors choirs and all of this stuff. So you're, you're talking about somebody here who's not, I'm not opposed to any music style personally at all. But I had someone come up to me and said, we need to teach these people to sing these hymns because what are they going to sing when they're older on their deathbeds? Now, there's so many issues in that to begin with. And I said, well, you know, most people these days don't even know how to read music. So we'd have to back that train up and teach them how to read notes because this was a tradition where people sang in four-part harmony. And we'd have to spend hours and hours and hours on that. And as far as I can tell in here, we're told to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to the Lord, but it says nothing about the actual music notation. And then this person said to me this, Pastor, it is your job to teach people how to read notes in order that they might worship right and use these hymns. And by the way, when they say hymns, they're talking like European hymns from, you know, 500 to 300 years ago, mostly in some in the last 100 years. That is a tradition, a little t tradition. That is never a hill to die on in church revitalization or renewal. I don't care if we sing hymns, we sing modern music. I prefer Greek Orthodox church chant before the Western tonal scales, which, which would have blown this person's mind. He said, you know, by the way, the stuff that you're calling tradition is a little tea tradition of men. didn't even exist when these babies were being sung, when the psalms were being sung. This is not how they chanted psalms. The, the polychronic scales that we use didn't, didn't exist in the early church worship. You know, don't talk to me about that. I know my history. <laughs> but that's a little tea tradition. What I want to ask is how can we make disciples who understand Jesus and enter into the play of the word and spirit in the congregation? And whatever those things are, then we need to be flexible on those traditions. We're dying on the wrong hills. The problem with tradition, you have to wear a suit to church. You have to wear a preaching robe. They need to have all these. These are little t traditions of men. And Jesus says you almost are forgetting the main point in Matthew 7 verse 9 to the Pharisees. And today we still wrestle with the same things. Churches in Vancouver are dying and declining. So many of them are dying on the wrong hill. And the worst thing is when someone says, I would rather have the church die with my tradition intact than reach new people for Jesus. And to that, Jesus says, that tradition, I wash my hands of it. Go. And so if we're going to help people have peace with God, if we're going to have peace with God, we're going to have to know how to let things go and embrace the moving of the Holy Spirit. Or as the scripture says, sing to the Lord a new song as well. Is there space for that in our traditions? Again, the prophets declared to Israel that God was coming to correct this and to bring it to fullness that all people might know God personally. Jesus in John 10, 16 says this, I have other sheep that are not of the sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice for there will be one flock and one shepherd. 
We'll pick up a little more with tribalism and balkanization next Sunday, but I want to land this on the issue of the tea of tradition. There are some capital T traditions that we want to affirm and have firmly at the center of any living little old Orthodox church. Jesus as that center, his death, his teachings, his resurrection. And some of us have been dying on the wrong hills. As we are in a church that's been on a revitalization journey and others are considering joining in that, the temptation to die on the wrong hills is so strong for so many of us because it was life-giving to us back in the day. Some of us liked putting on that suit and tie back in the day. Some of us liked certain styles of music. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. By raising Lazarus from the dead before the resurrection, thou didst confirm... Okay, I'm not murdering that chant, but it's kind of like that. It's a little more uh, spooky sounding than I did it, though. What hill are you dying on that is not advancing the mission of God in your life and in the church? What tradition are you holding on to? Maybe it's about space. We haven't even got to sacred space, but we'll get there. In this time of COVID, all of our churches have been asked to re-look, to look again at what is it that's life-giving and what is it that is not. And I want to encourage you to get into the teachings of Jesus regarding the traditions that we see in his context, and then ask the application questions for our time. What is that tradition? Tom Rainer talks about this a lot, people caring more about things in the past than caring about the advancing of the mission of God. All of Israel fell into that trap again and again, but Jesus and the prophets predicted he came to set it back on the path to fulfill the law and the prophets and to move the mission of God forward which is that every person everywhere might have available access to him, through him, by his spirit. And so again, the church needs to always be reforming. I put put this out for you that when a church is dying, it has stopped the always reforming aspect. It has stopped asking questions prayerfully, rooted in scripture. And Jesus had to confront the Pharisees as well because they were misusing the scripture itself. He said, you read the words in John 5, and you know the words, but you don't understand the point. And they knew the Old Testament, we would call it their Bible in that day, the Old Testament better than any of us do today. He said, you read it, but you're missing the point. I have heard people misuse this again and again and again, forgetting that Jesus is the center, Jesus is the peak. That's how we read the scripture. So final word this morning is simply this. Understand that Jesus' way is always reforming, to make us more loving, to advance the mission of God. And God will use whoever is willing. In the Old Testament, he used a talking donkey to get his word point across to someone. The old wineskins will burst. New things will come because the Holy Spirit is creating new uh, communities of faith. Do we, are we going to be a part of that or not? Do we care that the next generation knows Jesus? Do we care that there's a witness of the church of the kingdom of God in Vancouver for the next generation? Or are we more concerned about creating museums and temples? We are not a historical uh, preservation society. We are to be a living body. What things have you placed in front of Jesus that you need to repent of? What are those things for you? We're trying to explore relationships here and working on revitalization for three years and we've asked these questions again and again. And I ask this to all of us who are watching today again and again, what are the traditions that are standing in the way of us being sensitive and moving with the Holy Spirit to advance the mission of God? Because Jesus gave the church this commission as he ascended into heaven, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Greek Orthodox Church, chant certain church buildings and choir robes and preaching robes. No, he didn't say that. You said, go, baptizing them in the name of a certain politics of the left or the right, progressivism or conservatism. You said, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the use of pews or church chairs. He said, go, baptize them in the name of expository preaching of one kind or storytelling preaching of another. He said, go, baptize them in the name of certain ethnic enclave churches. He said, go, baptizing them in the name of... No. He said, go, make disciples, baptizing them, which means to incorporate into living community 
in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and I will then be with you always when we do it on his way and his mission to the end of the age. But if we're baptizing them in the name of some tradition of the elders, more conservative than God, more liberal than God, so to speak, there is no power in that. It is dead religion, and he came to throw it all aside. Let's pray this morning as we move towards communion and remembering the point of it all. Lord, we thank you for your presence in this house. And God, some of us have been so wrapped up in our own tradition of the elders. Some of us have been so stymied in our ability to be on mission with you because we have put a fence around you. We've put guardrails around you. We've been more conservative than God. And it's kept us from being on mission and trusting that you are at work in our world and so, God, today, as we confront this T of the wrong kind of traditionalism, the calcified faith, Lord, help us to be wise. Help us to hear your word. Help us to soften our hearts, to be soft before you. Make our hearts soft, Lord. We want to yield to you. And, Lord, if we've been dying on the wrong hills and we've been putting the wrong things in the center, Jesus, help us. Forgive us. In our efforts to control you through our rules, we've missed you. Forgive us. Blow a fresh wind of your spirit in our heart and our mind. And God, if our attitude is reactive or defensive, Jesus, help us. For we are not here to be a clothing style society, a historical maintenance society, a museum, an end of museum keepers, but rather we are here to be a living joy-filled foretaste of the party that is to come when you make all things new and invite others to center their lives on outrageous ultimate love as displayed on the cross. May we die to the right things and live to the right things this day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, I got a little Pentecostal on you. My apologies. So many people experience these traditions and the hypocrisies in them and they walk out of the church never to return again. May there be less of that in this place. And this morning we're going to end with communion. And there are a few capital T traditions, by the way, that we do hold on to because they're explicitly taught in Scripture to hold on to. One of them, of course, is communion. And so this morning we want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 as we prepare to receive from the Lord. And I'm going to go grab my communion elements here. We can say elements, we can say symbols, we can say sacraments. We're Baptist land here, so we do believe that Christ is spiritually at work in everything we do when we gather for worship. I was joking with a, with a congregant this week who uh, struggled with different traditions on communion, and I said, sometimes... Those of us in Baptist land get a little too overreactive to 500-year-old fights with the Catholic Church. Uh, we do believe that Christ is at work and present when we celebrate communion, by the way. But some have overreacted and have the doctrine of the missing presence, the idea that somehow when we use materiality in worship that it's not blessed, that we need to be careful lest we get into some other weird tradition. Well, you, in your overreaction, sometimes we miss the boat as well. It's not like when we do communion in a Baptist church, the Holy Spirit flees the scene, you know? Like, God is present everywhere, working on everybody, except when we have communion, then the God leaves, you know? No, that's not the case. We believe the Spirit is present and active. So as we engage in this this morning, Jesus said to do this. So we do this, and every Christian group everywhere does communion in some way, shape, or form because it is a command of Christ, teaching of Christ. It's a foretaste of a feast to come. And so Paul, in teaching the church at Corinth, who had communion and all kinds of other injustices going on, he's teaching to correct, but he reminds us of the words of Jesus. And he says this in verse 23 in Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And if you want, here in our room with our volunteers, we have these little two-fur things of communion and juice put together. I want to encourage you to get your bread out of your communion cup here. 
And at home, if you have your bread, I want you to invite you to take it right now. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. These are also called the words of institution. He takes the bread from the table. And after he had given thanks, he gives thanks. And join with me, Lord, we thank you for your body broken for us, that this bread represents and physically embodies in some way. This body, he gives thanks, he broke it, and if you want, break your bread. I've got a little wafer. It's hard to break this little guy, but there it is. He took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I invite you, beloved brothers and sisters, family of God, kin in Christ, let's eat our bread together this morning. And wherever you're at right now, maybe just say, thank you, Jesus, for your body broken for me on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that your sacrifice brings us life. And that we don't have to live under the condemnation of the law. And that in your mercy you've reached out to us as you said to them, show mercy, go and do likewise. Paul goes on and he says this after he had given thanks. In the same way he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So with your juice or your wine or whatever you've got, let's drink of the cup and remember his blood spilled and shed for us. Lord, we thank you That as we gather on this first Sunday and we wrestle with the issue of tradition and tribalism, that we would be challenged by your word. And God, where we have been like Pharisees, putting heavy weights on others of our own rules that are not clear in Scripture, that are not taught by you, forgive us. For indeed, you say, instead of those heavy weights or those yoke, that we're to take your yoke, which is light and easy, because you shoulder it with us. And so, Lord, thank you for this sacrifice. And may someone take their next steps today in their faith. And God, if our churches are going to revitalize in this city, Lord, help us to know when a tradition is life-giving for those we are called to reach and leaning into our future versus simply a maintenance of the past. Because we don't want to be like these elders that Jesus rebukes. But we care more about our third level issues than the primary things. Move us forward, we pray, in you, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand, and we're going to do something traditional, because we can do both as long as it's not used to bind people. We're going to sing a doxology as we leave this place and prepare to leave this time together. So join with us as we sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy So this morning, um, as we leave, I do want to remind you, we're going to do a foyer chat. There is a link, a Zoom link, uh, right there on that same YouTube page. You can go check that out. I encourage you to do that. Join me in about five minutes. I'll be online about 11, 20, 23, right in there. 
Um, also, we'll, we will add another teaching online this week to deal more with the tribalism piece that we didn't fully get into this morning. Um, and so I thought about, as, as I was talking, that I would just add some of that online later. So pay attention for that. It'll be about 10 minutes online, probably on Tuesday as well. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for worshiping with us. Again, connect with us. You can uh, click on that to, to join us with your email so you get the weekly updates as well and what's happening here at Pilgrim. Home church is also where it's at. Please jump in a home church this week and go deeper with the teaching. Push back on what you want to, wrestle with it. Um, yeah, and again, I'm always available to talk online right now. Uh, we can do some one-on-ones with people if it's more of a, a consulting thing, according to Dr. Bonnie's uh, church regulations. Um, but let me know. We'd love to connect with you as well. So go in peace and serve the Lord. Thank you for everyone helping today. Amen. <laughs>